there everyone, it's Dr. O with another review video for your uh, viewing pleasure. So the purpose of this video is for us to do a very quick and dirty review of some of the most important topics coming from the autonomic nervous system. So in this picture that I have drawn here, we have the brain, we have the entire length of the spinal cord. So those make up the two components of the central nervous system. So the central nervous system, if you'll recall, its major function is in uh, processing of incoming afferent information uh, and then sending out the appropriate efferent signals, fully integrated responses in order to produce responses that we need in order to maintain homeostasis. So when we talked about the central nervous system, we said that both afferent and efferent information can come into or out of the central nervous system in through one of two different pathways. So information can come directly into the brain or directly out of the brain through one of 12 different pairs of cranial nerves. So the types of pathways that tend to use cranial nerves are going to be uh, coming to or from places that are already very close to the brain, usually speaking. So we're talking about the eyes, the ears, the mouth, uh, places like that, the nose, places that are already very close to the brain. There are some exceptions to that, but usually anything that uses cranial nerves is going to be something that's already pretty close to the brain. For just about everything else, we are typically going to use a spinal nerve, of which there are 31 different pairs. We have a number of different pairs of nerves coming out of the cervical spinal cord, the thoracic spinal cord, the lumbar, the sacral, and then finally the coccygeal. So, uh, in what you have already learned about the autonomic nervous system, you've learned that there's kind of two different sides to it, right? We have a parasympathetic side and we have a sympathetic side. So, each side of the autonomic branch of the nervous system is going to kind of have one particular thing that it likes to do. General, generally speaking, the parasympathetic is typically called your rest and digest, parasympathetic activity of different effectors is usually going to suppress their activity, lower energy consumption, lower usage of that particular organ. Uh, the example that I always like to use is the heart. So if your parasympathetic division is active, your heart rate is going to be suppressed, the workload on the heart is going to be suppressed, your blood pressure will fall. And that should make sense because if you're just nice and relaxed, in terms of something like oxygen usage and consumption, you shouldn't really expect your heart to have to work that hard because the demand for energy in the systemic tissues is not that high. The sympathetic branch, on the other hand, is going to be the opposite. This is going to be your fight and flight response. So you're talking about preparing your body for strenuous activity, some type of emergency, stress responses, things of that nature. So again, if we're using the heart as our example, when the sympathetic branch is activated, then you would expect your heart rate to go up, your blood pressure to go up, the workload on your heart to go up, all for the purpose of pumping extra blood out into the systemic branches of the circula circulation, all for the purpose of getting nutrients and oxygen to tissues that are currently demanding it in times of stress. So what we're going to do here in this video is quickly review how both parasympathetic and sympathetic information tend to get to their effectors from the central nervous system. So for the most part, we're talking about efferent pathways here. So the first thing to understand is that most organs, there are a few exceptions, but most organs in the body that are under the regulation of the autonomic nervous system are what we call dual innervated. So I'll write that up here. So they are dual innervated. And the word dual innervation means that you're talking about an organ that is simultaneously under the control of both the parasympathetic and the sympathetic branch. Now, usually that's not to say that both the parasympathetic and sympathetic are kind of swinging together all the time. So typically the way I like to think about it is the whole autonomic nervous system is kind of like a seesaw. 
in certain times, the parasympathetic will be dominating in cases of rest and relaxation, rest and digest. Other times, the seesaw will swing the other way and you will be predominated by sympathetic activity in which uh, you are exercising or under stress or some other type of strenuous activity, in which case parasympathetic activity goes down in favor of sympathetic activity going up. But the whole purpose of an organ being dual innervated is that we can do either or. We can reduce the activity of something like the heart when it's necessary. And then in other times when it's necessary, we can increase its activity. So the implication of this is that parasympathetic pathways involving neurons and sympathetic pathways also involving neurons are simultaneously going to connect from the central nervous system to the dual innervated organ. In this particular case, we're talking about the heart. Okay, so the color coding that I'm going to use here is I'm going to use a green pen when I am indicating a parasympathetic pathway, and I will use this red pen when we're indicating a sympathetic pathway. So that should be pretty easy to follow. All right, so the first and most kind of fundamental thing that we covered in the autonomic nervous system is that when you're dealing with autonomic motor neurons, the type of efferent neuron that carries an autonomic signal, this is going to be a little bit different than what we're used to so far. What we're used to is a single motor neuron coming out through either a cranial or spinal nerve and going directly to its effector. Usually when that happens, we're talking about skeletal muscle. So the skeletal muscle in your arms, the skeletal muscle in your tongue. In those cases, you only need one single motor neuron. But when you're talking about the autonomic nervous system, motor neurons tend to come in pairs. So with my green pen here, we're going to start with the parasympathetic side, and we're going to learn about what a parasympathetic pathway tends to look like. So one of the generalizations we can make about parasympathetic pathways is that with a few exceptions, parasympathetic pathways tend to come out of cranial nerves. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to draw the cell body of a parasympathetic motor neuron here. We'll draw it in either the pons or the medulla, could be either or, and it is going to extend its axon out through a cranial nerve here. And as it turns out, most parasympathetic pathways, ooh, that got really blurry there for a second. Let me see if I can fix that. Hang on. Hang on just a second. Did not count on this. What is going on here? Um, do not know why that is so blurry. Bear with me for just a second here. I am not sure why this is so blurry. Well, once I get this figured out, I will post a part two to this video. So this will be the end of part one. So sorry about that.